venue. So to the panel, the first afternoon panel uh, today, um, we'll uh, continue to enjoy their own comments and welcome back Miguel Diaz who's all here in the morning. I'd like to introduce two additional speakers to this first panel. The first one, we're very uh, honored to have Paul Chilcott, who is the advisor to the governor of the Bank of Canada since 2015. And Mr. Chilcott coordinates the bank's involvement in the modernization of Canada's payment systems and leads the bank's effort on CBDC. Um, and I was I want to iterate what I said earlier in the morning that the views expressed by Mr. Chilcott and potentially others are their personal and may not reflect those of the institutions they're affiliated with. The moderator for our panel, I'm very happy to welcome Brian Gelford, who is the um, Digital Asset and Financial Market Infrastructure Lead at EY here in Canada. And Brian looks like more than 25 years of experience in financial market regulation and market infrastructure. And he'll be the moderator for our discussion today. Um, we'll start with a discussion, but then um, Brian and uh, we'll open to questions as we go through the panel session. Questions, do we need a microphone or is that? I'm okay with that. Yeah. I think we're all right. Yep. All right. I, I have children, I'm used to yelling. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so keep the discussion for the Q and A. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here today. So we've heard a lot of um, really interesting perspectives on uh, central bank digital currency, on uh, alternative payment uh, uh, systems, um, and I think the first thing I'd like to do is is just turn to Paul um, because we are in Canada. Um, just. Just a, perhaps a recap. I mean, you, you're you're in the sort of unique position of um, being responsible for both uh, payments modernization and the CBDC project. So maybe just perhaps level set up on what's happening at the bank. Yeah. So in relation to CBDC, we're building the capability to issue a retail CBDC should it be decided eventually uh, that Canadians need one. I think that you know the first thing to say there: this would not be a central bank decision. It would be a decision. Uh, for the government, obviously we would advise, but it's it's something that very much would be for, for Parliament uh, and, for, and for Canadians, for people. Um, I think the second thing is to actually emphasize how difficult this is, which I think is something that's often kind of uh, missed. I mean, it takes uh, it takes quite a long time to launch a new payment system. Uh, as any, many of us know, with, uh, you know painful <laughs> and painful reality. And, uh, and the CBDC is it's actually also obviously both a, a new form of asset uh, as well as requiring a new payment system to actually um, actually transfer it. Uh, as as Daryl says, you could use, there's a question about whether you could use existing infrastructure, but I think that's, that's probably the case. The other thing is that you start a lot further back than people tend to think in the sense that if someone says, oh, I'm going to have a new um, instant payment system, there's a kind of template out there and you and the technology providers and you customize it a bit, but you basically know the, know the broad concept. With CBDC, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole range of motivations that have been put forward and there's a whole range of designs. And you can imagine a, a spectrum of possible um, designs where all they would really share is the name, actually. So you basically, first of all, you have to, you have to work out the what. Uh, and the why. Um, and then I think, you know, there's a point about technology, which is developing really quickly in this area. And that's why we, you know, we've chosen not to do the policy stuff and then go and look at the technology. We're investigating the technology alongside, alongside the policy. The technology is moving quickly and there's quite a lot of feedback from technology to feasible policy choices. I think particularly in the area of in the area of the of the key trade-off really of privacy versus compliance. Uh, then I think you know this then linked to the instant payment space. So uh, Canada um, is developing a new instant payments rail. So this would be a bit like I mean, it's hard to sort of compare across countries, but the combination of the rail and the services offered on it would be something like um, PICS, but with a you know different um, Different industrial organization on top of the rail, if I can put it that way. Um, and Canada is already a you know, heavily banked, um, heavily banked country. And instant payments uh, in Canada, as elsewhere, will be very, very uh, cheap, at least to the, in terms of the charge to uh, the bank providers. And so I think you know, the casual um, uh, assumption that uh, 
people will actually want to use um, this in a CBC product in Canada. You know, you have to be you have to be careful about that. And actually, a, an ex central bank colleague of mine who will remain anonymous said um, central bankers shouldn't fall in love with their own uh, with their own projects. And I, I think I think that's right. I think the question of uh, and actually the trick I think with a CPC would be you have to make it widely used enough. To actually achieve its policy objectives, even if, um, as Darrell says, you don't want to make it so widely used that it has certain um, negative financial stability. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, but obviously happy to expand on your stuff. Thank you. That's the question is coming. And it, it I, from my own perspective, um, in working with financial institutions, fintechs, uh, tradition, and, and also spending a lot of time in the TradFi space, one of the things I'm always asked is stable coins, central bank digital currencies, real-time rails. Um, how, how are all of these things going to work? Are they, is, will there be one payment rail to rule them all? Uh, or, or will we have a diversity? And Miguel, when, in your introductory remarks today, you talked about some of the core attributes of a central bank digital currency that are specifically apt for addressing some of the policy or use cases that, that you were describing. So where where would you, in, in terms of a CBDC, why why a central bank digital currency? Why a digital uh, M0 if we have these other potential uh, faster, cheaper, peer-to-peer? So this is, uh, so, so the answer to that one is uh, it's not one or the other. So the answer is that we should push everything and then just allow the public to decide what they want. Uh, but the point is, why do we need a, a digital M0? If we had a perfect world and we had the perfectly competitive and complete markets, we wouldn't need M0 probably. So from the perspective of the final user, it is the same if I settle my transaction with a digital form of M0 or a digital form of M1. So basically, it's, it's exactly the same from a functional perspective. But what we, with what we have seen in, in, in the previous decades is that uh, not everyone has access to this digital M0. Sorry, the digital M1, and the and and this lack of access is is really problematic. When, when, as I as I mentioned during my, my words in the morning, uh, when everything is becoming digital, so it is it is important to to foster every type of digital of digital uh, 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 infrastructure to allow people to actually set up their transactions in the digital realm. Now, why M0? Because um, not everyone is. Uh, a good objective for, for a, a private institution. So if you are below a certain threshold, probably you do not have the resources to pay a sufficiently large fee as to, as to make the bank recover the costs of the onboarding or of, of, of several other things. You might say, well, let's then develop things to reduce the costs of onboarding so that these individuals might become ready to open for the banks. But that is again going into the development of quite a, a broad uh, infrastructure that might be even more difficult than, than, than just uh, generating this uh, solution on N0. Now, when we talk about stable coins and we talk about uh, other types of, of, uh, of, of virtual assets, again, we need to, to forget about the technology for two seconds and just think about what a stable coin is. A stable coin is some entity or a group of people receiving certain resources in, in N0 and N1, probably. And then just uh, giving you a digital representation of that. The difference between that and a money market fund or a bank is not really that big. It's just a difference regarding which type of database they are using in order to keep your balances and allowing to move your money from one place to the other. So the financial risks and the financial problems that might be generated on the perspective, from the perspective of a traditional financial institution are exactly the same uh, as the ones that are generated by stablecoin. And, and we could see that very clearly with the Terra Luna situation. And for sure, we will continue to see these things in the future because the fundamental financial risk that is generated when you receive deposits does not depend on what type of database you use to keep these ledgers going. Now, the interesting thing of, of issuing an M0 is that you allow for a, for a basic platform to which everyone can connect. And this does not mean that the central bank will do everything but it means that we could generate a certain standard so that everyone can talk the same language and allow for this interconnection of these different uh, potential solutions. 
So in the end, it's not like the central banks are going to save the world or are going to provide the final solutions to everyone, but they, they might serve as a, as a focal point. So, so we have multiple potential equilibriums in these in this monetary systems, and the central bank might uh, just notch a little bit the, the, the market into one of these uh, equilibria that might be better for society. So Miguel, does that, to, to try and vulgarize a little bit, does that mean that you're describing a, a, a CBDC platform as a, a settlement layer and different uh, instruments would connect? Yeah, you could come out and, and <clears throat> a simple way of, of, of just uh, putting this in, 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 in like a traditional or like a very simple way is uh, imagine that I have my account with a partic particular PSP or imagine that, that uh, I have a stable coin or whatever and I need to pay you, Brian. And you are connected with someone else completely different. So the, the possibility, if, I, if you were in my same walled garden, then we could do right. a settlement right away. But if you are in another, in another network, what we could do is just use the, the, the basic layer, as you say, the settlement layer, and settle there so that uh, a little bit like the picture that, that Darren drew on, on his first uh, drawing, which is, uh, comes back from the 16th century. And this is exactly the same thing we need to do now. It's just providing that basic infrastructure in order to connect the two dots together and allow for this full interoperability with different types of money. Right. And does that, it, in order to address some of the financial inclusion issues, would that be sufficient or do you, you need to have a central bank or, or a central bank uh, owned entity who's providing wallets and accounts to individuals who don't otherwise have access. That's a, that's a very good question. And uh, we have several experiences around the world, in particular in Latin America, in terms of, of forcing private, uh, uh, private sector firms to provide certain services to the public. What you get out of those mandates is uh, not always what you expected. And the thing is, it is very easy to circumvent certain uh, requirements in terms of, of providing this type of services. So just imagine you're a person that wants to get a basic account, which is mandated by regulation to be free and available for everyone. But you're a banker sitting in your desk and the person just comes to you and you say, you know what, this one's better for you. And uh, it's almost impossible. It will be very difficult to get you this basic account. And this is exactly what you see happening in many countries whenever the regulator starts, uh, starts pushing uh, uh, the obligation for the financial institutions to provide this type of services. This is why it might make sense for the central bank to actually provide directly uh, the possibility of having balances uh, with, uh, with the central bank. But only as the last, as the worst case scenario, like, like the, 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 last, uh, the last resource that you would use as opposed to be like the, the most general way of, of providing services to the people. Now, in terms of going back to, you, to what you were saying about you know, deploying a CBDC when the key tech gaps are closed and the economics warrant the CBDC, given these other, given the introduction of fast payment rails, uh, systems like, like PIX, what, what would warrant that, that CBDC? Do you, do you see a world in which a retail or general purpose CBDC would be needed in, in parallel with those other? I, I think it's too early to tell, but I, I do see the possibility that uh, the kind of infrastructure that a central bank could offer in CBDC could have features that are not easy for the private sector to provide, even if you give it a back-end fast payment system. Uh, uh, that might include uh, common software uh, for purposes of smart contracting, for example. It doesn't have to be DLT, but... There could, there could be, uh, you know, we were just discussing this over lunch. Uh, wh where is the boundary drawn between what's the optimal provision of infrastructure by the public sector and where does the private sector take over? The so-called last mile, but that mile could be very short or very long. Uh, you know, a CBDC goes all the way into the wallets of individual consumers. And that might be, uh, uh, at, at some point in the future, optimal if you really want a new digital digital economy in which uh, you know the Internet of Things, Web 3.0 uh, applications that you want to interface with, uh, potentially instant uh, cross border payments, uh, programmable monies of various sorts. You know maybe that'll be easier to do. Maybe it'll be very hard to push the private sector just through regulation. 
provide that kind of innovation and competition. Now, on the other hand, you won't get that far. I mean, I don't see, uh, I think this is consistent with what Paul said, it's very, very difficult uh, for a central bank to provide something as complex as this. We shouldn't, we should back off of the pressure that people are putting on central banks to say, you know, where's your solution? Why, why isn't it coming in the next two years? I think in terms of decades, uh, I, I would say before, uh, we really will know how far the public sector infrastructure should go. And I'm not convinced yet, one way or the other, where, you know, where this is going to end up. I would be surprised if we don't end up with CBDCs in most places this century, uh, but that's not saying very much. <laughs> Sure. Now, I just wanted to comment, I think, on um, there are two ways of looking at this distinction, or at least two ways between M1 and M0. So I think it's easy to, to sort of fall into the way of thinking where this is purely about um, functionality, what payment uh, functionality people um, want or is economically beneficial. Um, but obviously, you know, the difference between M1 and M0 is obviously not just right now, but one is I mean, one's basically one's physical and bearer, uh, one's electronic uh, and account based. <clears throat> but obviously, there's also a difference uh, in issue. And the one thing that uh, private sector with whatever technology can never do um, is issue uh, a direct central bank liability. Right. So I think there's, you know, there's another layer of the conversation, which is what are people's, what almost what are citizens' rights? in terms of access to the central bank liability. And I think, you know, this legitimate have you take different sides of that, uh, especially in, in developed countries with strong, credible deposit insurance, you know, you can argue about how, how real that distinction is. Um, but if people have a right to transact in central bank liability, it doesn't really matter how real the distinction is. You know, that's a, in some, some rights are sort of fundamental. So I think there's a set of almost uh, political economy Questions about that, and I think just another another comment in the same spirit of sort of you know what is money. I think um, stable coins are not as novel as they seem. The technology. I mean, we've already talked about they, they look like money market funds, uh, and I think in the US, some money market funds you could use as, as checking accounts. I could be wrong about that. So there's already you know there's always been a layer of what I would call. Um, uh, <coughs> quasi-monetary liabilities, uh, not necessarily official, if you want to call it that way, um, but denominated in the years of account with some of the characteristics of money. Uh, and I think, I think actually PayPal was like that. I think you know, PayPal, you tend to think of, oh, I've got, a, I've got this PayPal money. Um, I think it's a kind of an unofficial, uh, non-monetary, uh, not non-official, but monetary, quasi-monetary liability. Uh, I'm not picking on PayPal now, I think, you know, there are other schemes, but it's the, I think the point is there. So I think one of the you know the question around stable coins a bit is I think where does this where does this um, the perimeter, if you like, of official of, of money sort of officially recognised and denominated in unit account, where does that line get extended and on what terms? I and mean, that's you know that's 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 in the presentation as well. Can I just follow up? Sure, sure. So does that mean, Paul, that since less reliable banking systems, unlike Canada's, uh, the access to uh, official digital money might be quite valuable, that we might see that happening in, in countries with less reliable banking systems first? I think you are, I mean, I think there are two things. There's, um, there's a question of how much trust people place in the banks. And also there's a question about what is the existing payment technology. So I think, it, I think it's notable that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the more, the more advanced countries living at CBDC are in the port from the you know, emerging, emerging world. And they're actually sort of leaping, I think maybe an issue about the banks, but they're also leaping a generation, or they're leaping to a different technology. The develop, developed world is <coughs> moving to instant payment systems. And then the question is, do you need CBDC on top of that? That's sort of analogous to uh, telephone where you had uh, in some jurisdictions a leap to wireless yeah. uh, because the, the, it was too costly to build the wired infrastructure. So they, they skipped that. Right. So in, 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 if we do see, I mean, we, we haven't talked a lot about uh, 
the, the, the stable coins. And, and I just want to frame that as when, when I'm referring to that as an alternative, it's really the regulated, uh, potentially regulated stable coins. So if we have uh, stable coins that are regulated in some jurisdictions, it may be decreed that only um, regulated financial institutions can issue stable coins or payment service providers will have to be regulated similarly to financial institutions. Um, do we see a stable coin potentially as um, a, a leapfrog, a regulated stable coin, over the development of real-time rails or uh, instant payments in those jurisdictions where they're not, they're not as like where Brazil is or potentially where Canada is? I think I'll, I'll put that as there as, as a jump ball in terms of uh, a regulated stable coin. As a as a viable means of doing the job. I mean, I would, I would, I think there are some. There's a first of all, there's a question about the regulatory regime for stable points, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that out. You know, the bank the Bank of Canada is is involved in that debate in Canada, but there are a lot of regulatory agencies here, which is a small, <clears throat> small part of it. Ultimately, it's a government decision. I think it, you know, in a monetary sense, the question I think it becomes: What is the value being added? By the state of so I think so. One line of argument is that there's something economically valuable in tokenization to enable smart contracts. But it, uh, I think you know, coming back to this technology, I think is basically neutral. And there are you know there are schemes out there now that are looking at tokenizing um, existing deposit. So I think again, you have to separate out the, the technology from who's using it. I think you know another very profound thing that people can lose sight of. Right, we tend to, we talk a lot about maintaining the unit unity of money, so the convertibility of central bank money into commercial bank money, one to one. But that, actually, it's quite a remarkable thing that people tend to forget that you know the most amazing unity of all is not just that, but the fact that TV money converts into RBC money, converts into whatever. Have a one to one. I think you know one of the issues for a world of stable coins, which I can, in some ways, I can see coexist. It, the ones denominated in the domestic unit account coexisting with existing forms of money. But you will have the issue that unless you create some central infrastructure, um, which actually that's why settlement and central bank money underpins the sort of one to one to one accountability. Unless you do that, you will have these actual sort of this series of closed loops, and if you had a you know a TD, again, I'll just name some, you know a TD closed loop, an RBC closed loop, um, but I don't I think it's pretty clear you'd actually be worse off than the world we have now, where the liabilities are uh, sort of instantly and easily convertible. So I think there's you know you have to, again you have to separate the technology and come back to some quite fundamental. Um, concepts about how central bank money relates to other money and those are to me they're sort of fairly timeless uh, that they're, they're technology neutral in fact i may i completely agree with paul in terms of, of the, the extreme focus on technology that we're having in these conversations so when we're talking about stable coins what are exactly we talking about? But, but what are we talking about is it just a representation the digital representation of the uh, holdings on a traditional currency, or are we talking about something else? If we're talking about the representation of traditional currencies on some digital realm, then that is exactly the same as the traditional financial institutions have been doing. So separating them doesn't make a lot of sense. What makes sense is uh, also what Paul mentioned regarding having the possibility of linking these things down so that a, a, a potential database using blockchain and DLT called stablecoin can actually talk with a bank that is issuing a representation, a digital representation of that money, which is not protected by a private and public key and a password, but just by a username and by the password. And instead of being held in a blockchain DLT database, it is held in an Oracle database. So the difference in the technology does not make a difference from the regulatory perspective of what we need to do in the future. Now, I know that but now, of course, the regulation is quite different from one or the other, and we have very significant arbitrage problems uh, in that matter that they actually have uh, exploded in a couple of cases, like the Terra Luna thing. 
And then, mm -hmm. so, so my perspective is that we, we, we need to take away the technology from the discussion. So in the case of uh, whether it should be a faster payment system or a CBDC, I could basically say that PIX has a, a, a synthetic CBDC. PIX is exactly a synthetic CBDC because when they use the key, <laughs> well, they have this, this the complicated element with some keys that they basically allow you to tokenize certain, certain amounts of money. And that is already a, a synthetic CBDC. And the people from Bank of Brazil actually uh, explain it as a, as, a, as a potential synthetic CBDC. So you cannot talk about the difference between a faster payment system and a CBDC. They, they both try to, to serve the same functions. Probably what we could talk about in terms of the, of the difference is whether the central bank is actually holding accounts uh, for, the, for the general public or not. And that is a, a significant difference. But from the perspective of the settlement, like talking about the faster payment system or CBDC doesn't make a lot of sense. It's more like a, a technology division that we are imposing in the discussion. And I think that we need to take two steps back again and, and see what is the financial complications that are generated by these transactions and just regulate exactly the same as we regulate the traditional ones because we have been uh, developing and fine tuning these regulations for decades. Uh, something, something good must have been done those five decades, so, so we might take uh, advantage of some of that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we need to modify whatever needs to be modified, and we should be open to to, to tweak here and there. But many of the of the fundamental issues are solved in the in the traditional regulation. We just need to apply to the technologies. The situation in the United States is quite different than most countries, including Canada, in that there is no national payments regulator, so you can't really. Uh, treat a stable coin and a bank deposit the same and simply say we'll regulate them the same because every state has its own payment services regulation. There's no national rules. Uh, that's why I think the Treasury Department recommended last fall that only banks be able to issue stable coins. But if they do, as you say, well, it's basically bank deposits all over again. Uh, so, so I think the regulatory environment matters a lot. In a country like Canada, you have, I think, more. Is that right, Paul? You have more national authority in your payment services? There are, I mean, it's actually quite a complicated picture here. So there's, there's Payments Canada, which um, is a, it's not officially an agency of, it has, it's a, established by Parliament, but it's not like an agency of the Department of Finance, but it's similar in spirit. And that has a mandate to run um, national payment systems. But it doesn't have an, actually doesn't have an exclusive right to do that. So the existing uh, e-money system uh, here run by Interact is, is privately owned. The bank has, we have national authority to regulate um, systemically and people who have a payment system. So there is that, there is that layer on top. But, um, but then you have, you have to separate out, I think, the regulation of the payment systems from the regulation of the issuers of the assets that are being transferred. So just, just to make sure I understand, if a private firm in Calgary uh, wanted to offer payment services in stable coins, was not a bank, uh, and uh, the, the, the government of Canada had concerns, uh, is, is there a way to regulate that activity on a national basis? Or? There is um, uh, the exact scope um, Determined by regulations which are not public yet, but there's there's a new retail um, payment regulatory regime coming on actually run you know, where, where the bank candle will be the regulator, where we'll be regulating essentially non-bank um, payment service providers. Um, but again, this is a question of the provider versus the coin. So I think you know another another issue that uh, countries everywhere are looking at, I think, is can, how easily can the, the current payment system regulatory regime be extended to uh, stable coins? And uh, the Basel Committee that looks at that stuff, CPMR, has made some recommendations on how you, how you could apply the uh, existing regime, but that obviously still has to be, has to be enacted in domestic legislation. So it's not as simple as I, as I thought. Uh, nothing's, nothing's as simple as, as one thing in this, in this world. I think. So I, I do have a few more questions, but I'd like to open it up to the floor. Any questions for the past? Yeah, yeah question for Daryl. Um, I raised a question internally of the Fed that said if, if the EU and uh, China, Russia, the UK, Canada all had a digital currency, would we have to? 
you mentioned the pristine and, and Lael's comments. I thought you were agreeing that at some point we would have, the U.S. would have to get a certain uh, critical mass was reached of other countries that CBDC is. Did I get you right? And then it, what's the reason? Is it just cost of doing business? Is it reserve currency status? Is it a bit of everything? I'm just curious, is there a critical mass? So I think we'll reach it. So uh, irrespective of whether the U.S. has a digital dollar, I think it needs to have the technology leadership. And so that when those international discussions happen among those countries about what are the standards, what are the limits uh, that the technology should be uh, restricted to and so on, the U.S. needs to have that technology so that it can speak authoritatively. Uh, so the R&D work that you're doing is crucial there. As far as having the digital dollar, yeah, I think there's going to be a point at which well, I'm not predicting this. I'm saying if th there comes a point at which most countries have CBDCs and there is some cross border, significant cross border use of them, uh, unless the United States has an alternative payment, cross border payment arrangements that, that interface well and efficiently with that, then I don't see how you, how you avoid it, at least at the wholesale level. There's a second question. Is it wholesale or retail or both or most of wholesale? Yeah, I would say at least wholesale, and I'm, I'm not convinced about um, retail yet. Yeah, so uh, we talked a little bit about similarities between uh, stablecoin and bank deposits. So I can tell you as an American living in Canada, one big difference is sending money uh, quickly cross border is not as easy uh, through bank deposits as it is, for example, with something like stablecoin, at least for now. Uh, so at all about today, we've talked about sort of the challenges and desirability of high-speed uh, domestic, you know, domestic or international payment systems. Could we maybe think, talk a little bit about what are the specific challenges to having an international payment system as opposed to a domestic payment system? Okay, sure. So that's exactly what I was talking about regarding arbitrage. So you can send transactions cross-border through stablecoin because they are not liable from the AML safety perspective fully as a traditional financial institution is. So from that perspective, we have to analyze whether the regulation AML CFT makes sense uh, because, because it makes the life of banks very difficult in terms of just sending cross-border transactions. If you see, for example, the case of, of Mexico, there is this phenomenon called the de-risking phenomenon in which uh, the US banks basically close the accounts of many uh, Mexican banks uh, under the problem that the, the, the uh, compliance costs were too high. So this is the case in the regulated entity, but then you have this very big uh, crypto asset exchanges and these crypto asset exchanges do not have the same level of regulation as financial uh, institutions. And therefore, these ones can basically uh, allow for the flow of money to go cross border. So I think, I think that, that, that these changes and the fact that people really need these cross border transactions will uh, make us think harder on which pieces of the regulation are really necessary for, for our systems to flow and to provide the best services for societies. I think that's, uh, that's exactly in the point in terms of, 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 of regulatory arbitrage and, uh, and, and, and this might allow us to think twice whether our current regulations make sense or not. Yeah, I think just if I could add, add on that, I think, well, first of all, cross-border, there's a huge amount of um, international focus on that among central banks, it's a huge G20 work for them. But if you, um, if you dig away at one of the issues in cross-border, uh, it's another area where you have to differentiate, I think, very clearly between what could be improved by technology, what's, um, what's regulation, because obviously, you know, the existing system could be made more efficient in some sense of the word efficient if you, you know, suspended all the, all the regulations. But that's not really, you know, the regulations are there for, there for a reason. Um, people, I think, also are not necessarily clear where they're talking about uh, a transaction that, that with a currency negative. So there's a set of questions about how you um, how you basically stream competitive FX rates so as to facilitate. Um, quite a lot of this is to do with actually um, different domestic implementations of common international rule sets in terms of even simple things like people's identity, whether it's your initial or your first name. So 
Uh, I think, you know, the technology can certainly be improved, but I think, uh, unfortunately, that will not make a, I mean, it makes, it will have some impact, but I think all those other building blocks, which are in, they're in the FSB work, I think they're going to have to be, you know, there has to be progress made on all of those as well to really, um, to really to see a big difference. I think the other thing to say is that, uh, you know, there's got, in, there are interesting projects to sort of link up um, regional, uh, but potentially beyond that, instant payment systems. And I think that's that's potentially uh, something that will bear fruit. But the, probably the regulatory challenges there are the same ones you'd have if you were trying to link up CBDCs. So I think we're going to think, I think we're going to have to solve them either way around. And then it would be a, a technical question as to which is you know, which of those solutions is going to get there get there first. I'm going to speculate that, that uh, looking at instant payment systems is going to get there first. Yes, I think that's, I mean, it's already happened. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, there's a, a yeah. project that you probably know, IXB, yes. Uh, yes. between uh, the European Banking Association and the US uh, real time payment system that, that looks to come online in the next couple of years. We will still, as you say, have all those regulatory checks. So I think um, most of us agree here that these technological advances will help the central banks to better serve the economy. But of course, this is conditional on uh, the incentive of the central bank doing what it is supposed to do to maximize welfare in the economy. Uh, but since these uh, new, te the new technological advances can allow the central bank also to do something when the incentive is bad, I wonder if you talk us about this situation. I mean, they can sometimes be influenced politically. We never know what will happen in the future. Have you talked about these scenarios? Well, we're all saints. What are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, Probably best not to say too much about that. I mean, I think the way I've answered that, I mean, it's cent central banks are, in the end, emanations of the state. And, um, there are, and so you, you do, I think, quickly get to questions which are really political questions and political economy questions, actually, about how, about the control of, you know, the control of central banks and what, what their duties are citizens and how far you need to restrict those. But I don't think they're, you know, they're, those are genuinely sort of, they're big social and political questions. And, and that actually, they're not ones that central bankers, I think, should opine on. <laughs> I think they're ones where, where you know, citizens need to opine on those. As a non-central banker, I can say that in my experience, it's very hard to find central bankers that are not trying to do the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> you see the same. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you can come back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, continuing a bit on the theme of uh, uh, international uh, cooperation or the lack of it and so on. So it seems that many central banks like United States, Canada, UK, and uh, so on, if they were to launch. Uh, they would have relatively similar design principles uh, that they would want to have. So I'm not asking about the likelihood of this, but uh, do you think it is desirable that like similar countries would launch something uh, similar? Obviously not making a current union, but like just similar features or, or not? Right. There's, there's one general answer to that one is, uh, and you see how the, the private sector develops things once and deploys globally. We can identify the economies of scale of doing that. And uh, with central bankers, what happens is that you do the research and development 150 times, and then you do the, the deployment 150 times and so on. So if we manage to generate a sort of a, an open source community uh, or the likes, uh, in which the different central banks can start putting pieces together. And I think what uh, Jim has done with the, with the MIT and the Boston Fed 
in terms of just opening up the code and, and setting it uh, for, for all the central banks is a great step in that direction, you know, like uh, uh, allowing all these central banks to stop duplicating work and uh, and taking advantage of this unique feature that might be replicated everywhere else with a, with a much lower cost. So from that perspective, the perspective of the cost of deployment is, is, is very, very useful to have similar things. And then from the other perspective, in terms of, of trying to interconnect uh, uh, different systems, uh, if you start with the same backbone, it is easier to make the connections and then start to be completely different backbones. It can be done, no? different backbones can be thrown together, but, uh, but it is easier to do it if the backbones are similar. Well, I agree with Miguel. As a matter of prediction, I'm not predicting that uh, different central banks are going to use relatively common technology or have relatively common features in the CBDCs that they end up using. Um, so that's you know, just a prediction. They, 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 there's no, they don't do that. I mean, uh, governments in general don't tend to do that in other in other areas of the economy. And they, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, take telephone, for example. It's, it's been different all over the world. It's starting to get a little more similar. I think I think the other thing just to say, though, is there could be, uh, I mean, there may there may be very good reasons, I think, for people wanting to build, build their own, um, which is not the same thing as saying not having broadly common standards, but there may be actually security reasons, for instance, for, for building your own product domestically. I think the other thing is there may genuinely be different objectives and so even among um, what you know we might want to label advanced economies there are actually you know there are big differences in um, access to bank accounts you know, there, are, there are other sort of social um, social issues um, there may be uh, you know actually and in the development world for instance, actually, it's notorious case. I think that, that you know, family structure actually, for instance, has quite a big impact on access to financial services. But even maybe things like geography as well. You know, if you have a small, if you have a very concentrated uh, population, that's very different from if you have areas with uh, you know, where geography or whatever makes it harder for, for technology to, to penetrate. That may lead you to a different design. So I think I think there may be. There may be a whole set of reasons why there will be variation, but I think you know, hopefully there will be sufficient common standards. There would be so that you could still have interoperability, because as we as we've discussed, um, you know, they're almost if CBDCs come to exist in um, the G7, say they'll they'll need to be cross border. Uh, you know, we'll need to link them together in the same way that instant payments I think will be linked together, and that will just be easier. If, uh, if certain basic conventions are the same. And a question for Mr. Chilcott. Uh, one of the areas uh, that you mentioned is kind of important to think about uh, in, in the context of CBC was the uh, intersection between, on the one hand, privacy, and on the other hand, uh, policies around AML, uh, ATF. Um, one thing I wanted to ask is whether you could provide a little bit more color on the direction of the banks thinking in that area, like how to achieve both. I mean, we are, um, we're starting to look at that. It's very much an issue for um, government, governments in, in, in Canada more broadly because of you know, federal and provincial legal regimes applied here. So I, I think it's, and obviously we're not the, uh, you know, we're not, we, do, we take as given, in a sense, we need to take as given the legal, the legal regime. But I think, you know, broadly the issue is that, um, you know, banknotes have certain privacy features which basically are inherent to them. And, uh, but as electronic money has developed, I think one could say that, you know, a slightly different regime in terms of compliance is possible there and has been imposed. And so if you turn, as I come back to the what earlier, so if you turn this um, physical bearer instrument into something electronic, which I think might be account like all that, that's a few choice. You then have to think about um, what regime is going to apply. And so I, I think the way I imagine it, but this may turn out to be wrong, is there's a kind of spectrum between maximum 
privacy is subject to compliance and maximum compliance <laughs> subject to privacy. And you know, one hopes that there is actually some space between those two things. Uh, but then I think it's a, you know, that's again a question for the government, for the society, as to what, I think as to where you, as to where you pitch it. And, and so for us, what we're just trying to work out, I think, is what is that space? And coming back to technology, are do technologies and they give you more sort of scope in a way to sort of pitch a product in that in that space. But again, I think it's I think it's broadly a policy question, but with technology sort of saying what's feasible as well as you know, rather than just what's desirable. There, just as a follow-up on that down, but all the all the reports are coming out now in response to the White House executive order. And that's a that's actually a good question, some of which is is as surfaced or has been suggested in some of those reports. So where where is that going now in the US? Where where do you see the US being situated on that spectrum? Uh, well, privacy is paramount in the United States, and there's been a lot of discussion about uh, in the administration and in Congress about the fact that they don't want a system for CBDC like China has, in which the data are available in a centralized government-controlled data base. So they, they're clear about uh, protection of privacy being you know, one of the most primary uh, objectives. But as to where they're going to go with that, I, I mean, first, the technology, as Paul said, even understanding the efficient frontier, what's available is, is a research and development project. And Jim, Jim and uh, his counterpart at MIT, Nehan Arula, are working on that, and they has they has emphasized to me many times uh, that that is a complex problem, and the whole frontier is a it involves many many trade offs. There's many many different uh, points on the frontier that you can achieve with technology. So you know, as to where they end up, I, I really don't know. Um, from a legislation perspective. SEC is eventually going to approve the cryptocurrency exchange platforms. And one of the reasons for doing so is uh, KYC in terms of actually taxing cryptocurrency transactions. So the payment rails will be anonymous, but the various endpoints in the marketplace will be regulated. So the government will regulate the, the endpoints in terms of uh, ensuring that the privacy is uh, properly managed and track, track personal information. So from your perspective, we believe that the SEC will actually legislate the uh, cryptocurrency exchanges within the next three months. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> Gary Gensler has uh, been relatively aggressive in saying that most, he said over 90 some percent, I think he actually said 97% of outstanding cryptocurrencies, he considers securities under the um, definitions that apply uh, for his purposes, and, and he intends to regulate, including the issuers and the exchanges. And as you know, I guess from the question, he's going after the exchanges, uh, like, uh, for example, Coinbase. And he wants to start there. And it's not only for KYC purposes, he's very concerned about investor protection. So I, you know, I, I expect very aggressive regulation, uh, but then the, the question, he, he can't legislate, he can only implement uh, laws that are established in Congress. And now the question is, uh, what kinds of uh, suits uh, against the SEC uh, will be successful? Coinbase has already, uh, um, I, I think it's actually filed its suit against the SEC. Uh, and and uh, the courts the courts will opine, they've already, opine that the uh, Environmental Protection Agency overreached uh, its legislative mandate. And I think they're of a mind, the current courts in the US are of a mind uh, to limit uh, the scope uh, of SEC regulation in this area and possibly in other areas that the SEC has gotten into. Uh, so, yeah, you know, to be, to be seen, it's gonna be exciting television. <laughs> and then there's a bunch of the SEC and the CFTC. And Coinbase is lobbying to get the CFSD in their camp. Right. Whereas the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, and IEX are 
lobbying the SEC to get them in their camp. So uh, it's more of a political game than an actual scientific game. Uh, yes and no. Uh, I don't think Eric Gensler is reacting that much to politics, but he will be limited by the courts. So I think it's actually going to end up being, in this area, a legal matter rather than a political matter until uh, politics in Congress actually lays down the boundaries, which it may do uh, after the midterm elections uh, sometime next year. They may actually uh, try to define the jurisdictions of the CFTC and the SEC in this area. And it's really hard to predict. There's many, many trial balloon uh, uh, draft pieces of legislation, quite different looking. And I, you know, I'm not going to handicap uh, what's likely to happen next year. And the last rumor of the day is that Kraken and Custodia are trying to get a federal bank license right now. They're afraid that might happen in January. So this whole issue of payment rails will come to fruition uh, because it has to happen sooner than later. Otherwise, the cryptocurrency banks may uh, have a, an event strategic advantage. Yeah, Caitlin Long at Custodia has sued the Fed for not having uh, given Custodia a master account that would allow them to use uh, the bank rail payment system. Uh, there is another act uh, that's been drafted at the House Financial Services Committee uh, that would give the Fed discretion in this area. Um, I'm partially conflicted on this. I'm on the board of directors of TNB, which has also applied for a master account, not to do payments, but rather just to uh, allow depositors to invest money. TNB uh, sued the Fed uh, for not uh, having granted it an account under the existing statutes. Uh, well, there's some debate, but it seems pretty clear. It says that the Fed, quote, shall uh, give an account to any eligible uh, institution. I I'm not compensated in any way. I don't have equity. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I do think that the Fed uh, is rightfully concerned about establishing precedents in this area. Uh, Chairman Powell said that it would be hugely consequential uh, to give accounts uh, to the fintech banks that have asked for them, among other uh, narrow bank types. And the Fed's still sorting out its views on this. It's taken a long time, and uh, it'll either it's it's going to continue to go slowly. I predict unless Congress uh, moves on that. But in the meantime, uh, it, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in terms of which fintech firms are going to be able to, to get accounts at the Fed. It's a little bit ironic because on the one hand, uh, the Treasury Department has said only banks should be able to issue stable coins, uh, with the reasoning being that uh, that would provide for a safe and sound uh, regulatory <laughs> environment uh, for, safe, uh, for stable coins. But on the other hand, uh, the Fed has been very reluctant uh, to allow uh, the types of banks that would want to issue stable coins to actually issue them by, by failing to giving them. Uh, it doesn't, it's not really business viable if they don't give them a master account. So uh, as I said, it's, the Fed is basically in the course of making up its mind that it will uh, in the next year or two. David, how are we doing for, for time? We still have uh, 10 minutes. Okay, great. Uh, Rodrigo, would you have a question? I'm trying to to visualize uh, the difference uh, between a stable coin and the C a CBDC proper stock segment of the population. I'm thinking that we're already banked and uh, you need to decide between both uh, the means of payment. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that much of a difference because I mean, both are, and I'm thinking about our partial delivery analysis. I mean, as a customer, from the point of view of a customer, if, if I have to decide between both, I mean, obviously, programmability, and I'm setting aside monetary policy issues, uh, and M1 and M0 digitality is also a side because you know, I already banked. So, is there a, a huge difference for, for that segment? My answer will be unfair with you, but uh, if I put you with whatever you know now, six months ago, and uh, ask you whether you would like a, a dollar issued by the Fed or a dollar issued by, by Terra Luna, what would you say? <laughs> that's, that's the only difference. In terms of functionality, you may have the same thing, but the probability that some guy is not actually fulfilling the responsibilities with you is much higher than the other. 
Presumably, though, that would, and I, I think of Terra Luna, it's for, for sure, I, I be, at the end of the spectrum, if you look at stable coins and you have a stable coin which is issued by the Royal Bank of Canada versus a purely algorithmic pseudo Ponzi scheme, right? So it's it's not the it's it's not the fairest. I agree. Exactly. Okay. I agree. I agree. But it's one example, right? It's, yeah. so it's it's within the possibility. So so you have to analyze just as you analyze now whether you have to your deposit with a, with a very known bank or with a bank that has two million dollars in capital. Right. It's the same question, I think. And I think the other question goes to the, when we talk about, again, about use cases, and, and we're talking about um, modernized payment systems versus, versus the, uh, uh, the, the crypto assets, is this whole opportunity to, to live, spend, and earn in Web 3.0 or in the Internet of Things, which we really haven't, we haven't delved into that here, but um, certainly you need to have an instrument that lives in that ecosystem. But it's our, you could replicate the functions without living in that, in that decentralized world. So you can basically connect centralized institutions with a decentralized environment and run smart contracts from the centralized perspective. So there's no restriction technologically that you have to have the same, uh, the same structure behind that. So you can set the conditionals upon the decentralized finance. So right. you, you write your smart contract on the decentralized platform, and then the conditionals can be whether you get the signature from a centralized entity that is set on the other side. So if you manage to get these two things together, you can actually join the centralized solution with the decentralized solution. So this is not something that, that you must go to the other side of the other way. The thing is, most of the investment is going into that direction of right. trying to do the things with the same platform and so on, but that doesn't mean that it is not possible to join the two worlds together. And that's distinct from the on-ramp, off-ramp model, where, where when you talk about a direct link between, uh, let's call them, for lack of a better expression, real rails versus the, the uh, uh, Web3 rails, right? Um, Typically, now we look at the on ramp off ramp, and I think Tom made reference to that when we talk about who's regulated, right? The endpoints. But that's a different, you're suggesting it's a different model than, than I go to my bank uh, and then I, I move money from my bank to a platform which spits out a stable. Yeah, so, so, so regarding, regarding uh, uh, going back again to the functionality, so we need within the, 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 the blockchain platform that we want to. Uh, deal with. So imagine that you have in the metaverse and you have some uh, NFTs that you want to actually purchase. That, right. uh, you do it with a coin that is issued within that metaverse environment and within that platform. That would be very easy you know, to, to, to deal with the same platform. But, but on the other condition, there is nothing that avoids you from getting the, the oracle or the source of information from the outside. And if you manage to do that, given that these are uh, uh, systems in which you have basically virtual computers there, you can program whatever you want. And you could program this uh, interaction between the decentralized world that you're trying to buy your NFT from with the centralized world in which you will get certain uh, notifications. So most of the, of the fast payment systems that you get around the world, they, they generate a notification, which is basically a digital signature by the operator of the, of the faster payment system. So based on that digital signature, you take that as a trigger to fulfill the transaction on the other leg within the, the metaverse, for example. Well, I don't know if I will answer that. No, I just wish there was some of the in Canada here. I could ask them if I could buy uh, uh, you know, NFTs using the <laughs> real-time rails. <laughs> so with the introduction of a CBDC, maybe that competition between stable coins is not fully settled yet. So let for example, we have read Bitcoin because you can do some things on Ethereum that you cannot do on the Bitcoin blockchain. And so would it be easy to create red CBDC on a private platform because the CBDC settlement layer doesn't allow the same functionality as a private settlement layer does? And, and where does this competition then end? So now um, will then central banks have to offer more settlement? Functionality and richer things, or are the central banks okay to have red CBDC floating around with all these other platforms, or how do you think about that? 
<laughs> so that's a, that's a good one. But if you if you offer a platform that is a, a complete a complete virtual computer environment uh, from the perspective of the CDC, then you can basically mount whatever you were developing on the other private sector uh, application on top of yours. The thing is, if we decide to go on an implementation of a CDC with limited functionality in terms of the programmability, so that it is not a doing complete, complete environment, then you start getting into the problems that you mentioned that we need to actually increase this thing so that the, the creativity of the private sector can actually uh, take place and, and, uh, and generate these this new services for society. But if you generate a complete a touring complete environment in your platform, I think I think you're you're okay to go. But I might be wrong. I don't know. Any other questions? Yes. So I'm wondering whether the CDC could be a solution for some evolving economy because for some evolving economy, the central bank can have credible, uh, you know, uh, monetary policy because. It, People we in the country we worry about the country kind of too much, you know, a lot of money. So if you know the if we use the, the, the CDC as part of the DLT DLT technology, at least make it uh, the transparent in terms of you know, the quantity of money circulated in that country. So I, I wonder why is this possible maybe a solution. I mean I think just on um the link with with monetary policy, monetary policy. Maybe um, this will this will help. Or maybe we'll, I think you know most money already in the economy is is not central bank liabilities. Uh, it's commercial bank liabilities. And if you assume that we're not, you know, we wouldn't be trying to destabilize the the banking system. I think you you'd have to assume that. The launch of the of a different form of official currency didn't really change the sort of um, the dynamics of monetary aggregates, uh, where you know essentially um, we operate. You know, unlike the textbook model, we operate by, by setting interest rates, and then you know the monetary aggregates are kind of what what they are. You know, in in reaction to that. So I think probably the direct the direct link is less. <laughs> Uh, well, it's not, it's not clear in my mind that, there will, that there's that kind of implication. In my perspective is that, that you have no difference between the, the implementation of monetary policy, whether you do it like in the traditional way or you go to a CDC, it all depends on how much uh, or how many resources you issue. That in the other side implies what interest rate you're setting. So this is like, like the interest rate quantity of money thing and the I know this has changed a lot, but, uh, but just to simplify it, I think that it depends on, on what are the issuance rules. So a CBDC is not like a magic wand that will allow you to be stable and trustable uh, looking forward. Uh, it all depends on what is the issuance rule that you have within your CBDC, just as it is the case for the, for the traditional issuance of currency. So I think there's no difference there, I don't know. But probably I misunderstood the question, I don't know. <laughs> So I tried to request me try to because the director of blockchain technology at least has a time in terms of you know the quantity, the security that we that the CBDC platform people in the country really know the quality and you know <laughs> so that at least you know because all the records cannot be easily modified, so this in that sense uh, will make this you know at least the supply of money and that platform is more about. I, I, I think I get the gist of your question. Uh, let's take uh, the world of paper money and the central bank is cheating by not providing the monetary aggregate correctly. They're, they're not saying how much paper they printed. Uh, and now the question is whether they are uh, going to a ledger based money uh, will correct that. Um, I don't know if I controlled the ledger. I don't know the technology expertise. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I could still cheat, but um, yeah. uh, cheaters going to cheat. <laughs> I don't think there are many countries in the world where the central bank is actually not telling the truth about how much paper they printed. But in some countries, they printed way too much. <laughs> Any other 
Last one. Last question. Um, a very good question. So, can these technologies provide um, data in real time for us, for instance, to measure aggregate consumption at a high frequency or any other uh, or any other output measures that we are interested in? Yeah, the, the, that's the case for faster payment system, for any, any digital representation of money. And the many central banks that have faster payment systems actually use the, the, the daily data on, on outcast models in order to feed them the boards of governors with, the, with up to date information. And what is very interesting is that sometimes what you see in the payments flow is quite different from the information that comes out of the surveys on the traditional uh, economic data. So it's, a, it's quite interesting from an economic perspective to identify how can it be the case that if every transaction has to be settled, uh, most of these large transactions that modify the, the for example, consumption or, 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 or GDP or things like that should be done digitally. And why there is such so much of a difference between what you get out of the surveys and what you get out of the, of the real data. I think it's a matter of, of time which uh, we will start narrowing the, the gaps between the, the traditional uh, measurements and, and what you get out of the payment systems. China Central Bank can see pretty much as much as it wants, not just aggregates of flows, but it, you know who is spending how much on what uh, in principle. So uh, it's you know loss of privacy, but gain in monetary uh, <laughs> policy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just just quite. I mean, that would you know, would never happen here because of because of privacy rules. And actually, you don't you, know, you don't need it for macro for macro policy um, making. But when the when the pandemic struck, so actually that was a you know a point where there's a big shock. And so the normal backward looking data that we do you know tend, tend to rely on obviously became un, you know unusually. Um, uh, Unreliable in terms of trying to work out what was going on. We did, we did, um, you know, we gathered data from various aggregate data from various payment system providers because we were looking for, you know, we were looking for any clues we could get actually as to what the real nature of the shock was because official data was just, you know, was just not helpful. Very good. Thank you very much. Let's conclude our first afternoon panel.